Welcome to a place of wellness and healing for both your body and mind. Get ready to live a happy, healthy, energized life that totally rocks. You're listening to Straight Talking Natural Health, a no BS podcast for busy people who want to ditch the fatigue, find balance and feel great with your host and naturopath, Jules Galloway. Today's guest came to me in one of those weird universe has got your back kind of scenarios. I was chatting with a trusted friend of mine and prior guest on this podcast, Emma Park, and she was raving about this person and the work that she was doing in the quitting alcohol space as a mentor and coach. And then like literally a couple of days later, I got an email in my inbox asking me if I'd like to interview this person on my show. And I was like, um, yes, spooky, huh? Like, how could I say no? So Her background with alcohol looked a lot like many people's in Australia. At first, you wouldn't even necessarily say it was a problem because it's so common. Social drinking that turns into social binging and then waking up with chunks missing from your memory of the night before. It's social and on weekends, so it's okay, right? Not a problem. But there's a new movement beginning to happen in this country and I can feel it taking hold. Where people are saying no to binging and excess, this all or nothing drinking culture, and facing up to both the physical and mental health issues that it can cause. So I'm really keen to pick this person's brain to find out how she did it and how she now helps other people to do it too. So please welcome to the show the very lovely Danny Carr. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, Jules. Thank you for that. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so glad to be able to meet you like this. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm feeling good. Excellent. Excellent. So look, let's let's start at the start. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? Because it is, it's quite an interesting one. So look, how did you, how did all of this come about? And how did you get to the point where alcohol was impacting your life in a negative way? Mm. Uh, well, I'd started drinking from an early age, probably around 13, 14. And I grew up in central Victoria in a place called Castlemaine. And small country town, bored teenagers, nothing to do. And so we basically what we did was just drink every weekend. We'd sneak out and get someone to buy some booze, usually like a cask of Fruity Lexia or something gross. (laughs) We (laughs) must be about the same age, mate. (laughs) (laughs) And um, so and that's what we did. Like every weekend we drank. It was, you know, I was probably now looking back in hindsight, a bit of a socially awkward kind of person. So it gave me that bravado and that confidence and I felt cool I felt edgy and so I just kind of went with it and then into my 20s you know it just kind of just progressed I guess I'm a musician or was a musician I I still am but I played a lot more in my previous life and married my husband who's also a musician Ash Grunewald is a blues musician and uh, you know we got together early like 24 and, you know, in the music industry, it's just expected. Like, that's what you do. You rock up. It's probably one of the only jobs that I can think of where you rock up to work drunk <laughs> and you're expected to do your job drunk. And it's well, not- mate, I, I was a stripper, so I reckon we've both oh, had true. the only two jobs where you can rock up drunk. Oh, my anyway. God. <laughs> Yeah, wow. <laughs> it's um, expected. <laughs> so, yeah, stripping as well then. Okay, that is another one. Two jobs. Uh, All right. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, and it's, you know, like, you, yeah, anyway. So that kind of kept going and, you know, as, say, my husband's music career took off, the rider gets bigger, you get more money coming in. So it just became, and it went from Fruity Lexia to Fine Wines, you know, and then suddenly I'm a bit more classy and, <laughs> just drinking all the time we had some we had two um, two kids two girls and you know I didn't drink through my pregnancies but certainly while I was breastfeeding you know trying to figure out calling midwife friends asking them when is it safe when can I do it and pumping and dumping and all the rest of it and then pretty much as soon as I'd stopped breastfeeding I was back to binge drinking again and it started to get to the point where I noticed a few times of putting my girls to bed like I didn't want to put them to bed sometimes. Like I'd look for, you know, beg anyone that, you know, can you put the girls to bed? You know, can you do do that? Or And then I couldn't be bothered cooking them dinner sometimes, which I would, but I wouldn't be making them, you know, a really nice meal. Um, and then I was getting to the point where I couldn't remember if I'd, you know, that I'd put them to bed. I couldn't remember putting myself to bed. And God, and there was just so much shame around that and waking up 
in the morning sometimes, not all the time, but scrambling quickly down, you know, firstly running up, check them in their bedrooms and then do I feed them, you know, and then looking for evidence that I've fed them or checking that, you know, the littlest one had a nappy on with my heart racing and just, oh my God, who even am I, you know? And, you know, not only that, just that classic, you know, checking my phone, who did I ring? Who did I, and I kind of, I guess the more Ash was away on tour, the more lonely I was. So the more I was drinking on my own and making drunken phone calls. And so I just was waking up the next day with that fear and that anxiety. And like I said, just not liking who I was, you know, talking to myself, like waking up and just going, you fucking idiot. You did it again. Fucking did it again. You know, asking people, how was I the night before, you know, how was my behavior? And I just got so sick to death of it and it's, but I couldn't stop. And I'd be Googling things like, am I an alcoholic? And everything I read about alcoholics on the internet was, you know, that they were daily drinkers and they drank vodka for breakfast. And, and I didn't fit into that category. I was someone I could go for a couple of weeks sometimes without drinking, or occasionally I'd have the odd wine and leave it at that. But then suddenly on a Tuesday, I can't remember putting my kids to bed, you know, and it just had, there was no rhyme or reason to it. So it was really hard to kind of see it as a problem enough to stop or to go to AA or to get a drug and alcohol counsellor, even though certainly I had thought about those things. Um, And then finally, a friend of mine said she was going to take a year off. And after a particularly bad binge I'd had where I was vomiting all over my shoes in front of my kids, I just thought, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take a year off with my friend. And my husband said he'd do the same my friend Scott Owen, the bass player from The Living End, and his girlfriend, they said, yeah, we're in as well. Let's do this. And, um, yeah, it was a pretty big year, that year of giving up. And then at the end of it, deciding, oh, no way, I'm not going back to that. Oh, I can't go back to that. I've done, I feel too good about myself. You know, a year of waking up, not telling yourself you're a fucking idiot and a loser. Mm-hmm. Um, it was transformative. And I just thought, I knew just from experience that I cannot moderate this thing. It doesn't work. I just, you know, sometimes I could have one, but pretty much all the time. I don't know why, but I would just be like this freight train and I couldn't be stopped. And, you know, so I, it was just, I waited up and I just thought, no way, I'm not, I'm not going back. So when you were really in the thick of it, did other people ever notice that you had a problem or bring it up with you? Or was it just kind of, put in the socially acceptable pile I think it would depend on who you were with and how drunk you'd got the night before so there was certainly a lot of friends like oh you're fine you're fine don't worry about it um then there was other friends that would sometimes call you on it go geez you were pretty wasted last night or you were a bit of a dick last night um you know I remember my brother saying to me I tried to call him a few times he goes oh I don't call I don't answer your phone calls after six because I know you're just drunk you're just calling me drunk that was a big moment for me. I was like, oh, wow, that's pretty embarrassing, you know, because all the times I'd call people um, when I was drunk but pretending not to be drunk and thinking that I was nailing it but <laughs> people could see right through it. <laughs> not nailing it at all. <laughs> not nailing it, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And and do you think it was starting to affect you socially? Because it sounds like you were starting to naturally, like, avoid some people but hang out with other people more. Yeah, it was affecting me socially and mostly in that I would have conversations with people and they'd say, oh, yeah, you told me that already. Or mm. I would ask them something and they'd go, I told you that the other night when you rang. And I'd just be so embarrassed. And so I was really starting to do this thing of having conversations with people pretending I knew what they were talking about <laughs> or really going in there with like kind of stop me if you've heard it type thing and trying to laugh it off if they said, you know, so it was affecting me in that way. It was also affecting me in that I was starting to not trust my own behaviour. So if I was to go to a party, I'd just be so on guard and really trying to manage my drinking, you know, one every hour or a glass of water in between. There was always this kind of, um, I was always trying to manage it in my own head. Um, So I was just feeling uncomfortable all the time and... It was really, it made me really, uh, it made me lose my confidence and it really affected my self-esteem. Yeah. Mm. And then when your confidence is affected, then you drink more. Exactly. Yeah. So then you get to the party and even to remember, to forget how you were 
the week before, you just kind of quickly guzzle a few so you can forget about it, just move on. You know that you're not going to think about it or feel uncomfortable once you get over that threshold. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and then the same thing happens again. Yeah. Talk about going around and around in circles. Oh, it's the worst. Yeah. So given the sort of the scene that you were in, like I, I've I've, you know, hung around the music industry a little bit and I've been, you know, backstage at events. And yeah, there's a there's a lot of things going on. Mm. Like it's a minor miracle that you found people who were keen to go alcohol free with you, <laughs> given your circle mm. of friends. Mm. Um, how how was that like did you all end up succeeding or how did it all go for everyone who made that pact yeah so the friend whose idea it was my friend Lisa her and her partner didn't last they only did about three months and um so but you know they still do three months was great Scott and Claire um yeah they they stuck to it and that's been amazing for them as well um, yeah. yeah, and you know, certainly in in Scott's band, you know, the they kept drinking, and Scott would go on tour, and he's like he's remarkable what he did, and he was a huge drinker, and the fact that he was able to go on tour with his band that he's always drunk with, and hang out with you know other rock stars that are drinking, he was just pretty solid in his decision, and again, he just sort of weighed up the benefits as well. Cost risk analysis there was like. No, it was for him as well. It was just like, no way, not going back to that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I When I quit smoking, I was actually working in nightclubs when you could still smoke in nightclubs. And I remember my my manager used to just light two cigarettes and give me one. Mm. And then I'd be like, oh, I'll just smoke this because he's lit it now. And I, I kind of feel like the same thing would happen if, you know, if you go somewhere and people weren't aware, or even sometimes if they are aware that you've quit drinking, they just get you one. And then oh, you're faced yeah. with that decision in that moment and that temptation in that moment of, oh, they've, you know, they've brought it to me now. Yeah, I didn't really have that because I'd made it so abundantly clear that I, I told everybody. And that was the other thing. In the first two weeks, I thought, what the fuck have I done? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't turn back because I've literally told everybody I know that this is what we're doing. Don't offer me any drinks. <laughs> Radical um, accountability. I like totally, it. This is good. <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, if I was to go to a party, I always, and this is one bit of advice I'd give to people, is as soon as I got to a party or as soon as I got to an event, I would make sure I'd beeline it and get myself a non-alcoholic drink or take my own so that I had something in my hand all the time. So I never kind of had that to negotiate. Uh-huh. I remember Ash yep. also said early on, I think he was doing a show with Jimmy Barnes, doing support with Jimmy Barnes. And there was a huge rider and backstage. And then someone came up to Ash's sound tech and said, what's Ash drinking? We'll get him a drink. And then Ash's sound guy said, oh, no, Ash doesn't drink. And he said, as soon as he heard that, that was in the first two weeks of this quitting, of that 12 months, this, Ash said, as soon as he heard that something flicked in his mind and he just thought, well, I, I don't drink. I don't drink. It's easy, you know. And then so he had also people around him that knew um, not to offer him any. He's had punters buying beers or offer to buy him beers when he's playing and he just, yeah, he just says, no, I don't drink. Get me kombucha if you want to get me something, you know. <laughs> how, how very Byron of him. I'll have kombucha. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now not he predictable for, at all. <laughs> yeah, now he has a heaps normal, the, you know, the, he likes those. Yeah, but, um, yeah. If they feel that, yeah. So, yeah, I think just um kind of manning yourself and making sure you're ready is was kind of really um it really helped us at the start yeah I love that tell everybody approach because then it's just done yeah yeah so okay we've talked about the friends that were on board who had a go at being alcohol free with you but what Mm. about all the ones who weren't like Mm. were, were they okay with it did you did it cause friction in any friendships no, it's such a good question. Um, it didn't really cause friction, but what it did do is it changed a lot of our friendships. So there was people that we drank with all the time, like every weekend kind of thing, and always going around to particular people's houses. And to this day, we've never been invited back since. <laughs> and that was a little hurtful at the time. Mm. And then some people that I really wanted to stay friends with, I would ask them to do something else. So perhaps go for a walk early in the morning or catch up for brunch 
or um, that didn't involve mimosas, <laughs> but doing something different with them. But kind of eventually it just kind of trickled away, those friendships. And at first I thought I would never, you know, that would just be heartbreaking for me. But funny, it, it hasn't affected me that much. I've made such beautiful friends, friends that I used to avoid like the plague because they didn't drink and now some of my closest, <laughs> my closest <laughs> people and, um, you know, and they're beautiful and I'm so grateful for them. But, yeah, it definitely did affect, you know, even within my family, I've got a family of quite big drinkers. And, mm. of course, I copped a bit of curry off them, like, oh, you party pooper or, you know. But, they're, you know, it's all pretty lighthearted. They're pretty cool and I think they're pretty proud of me. So, yeah. It yeah, hasn't been it, too bad. That's awesome because it can go either way with the old family, I reckon. Yeah, and I had one lady on my podcast who um, she got emails from her friends breaking up with her because she was <gasps> drinking. What yeah. the? Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. kick I mean, them to the curb, please. <laughs> well, it's got a question that, you know, how important that friendship must have been to them, God. you know. It's one thing in yeah, sobriety I find that the friendships I do have now, they're so... What's interesting, we're not in each other's faces so much. When I was drinking with friends, it's like we were in every bit of their lives and, you know, you've had a fight with a partner, you're in there trying to help and, you know, full on no boundaries. But I've noticed now that we don't drink, there is a bit more of a boundary with people, but but yet more connected, if that makes sense. Like mm. the conversations are really meaningful and beautiful, but I'm not needing to know the ins and outs of their relationship most of the time or I'm not getting certainly not getting in there trying to help out or you know um so it's given a bit of a boundary as well but but given more connection I don't know if that makes sense yeah it's almost like it sounds like maybe the alcohol fuels like an intensity or a drama that needs to you know that just gets stripped away and you get to see what the friendship really is Oh my God. Yes. I've never actually really looked at it like that, but that's so true. Like, and alcohol does, it creates such drama and this need for drama. And if you kind of have that, the, that, that kind of pattern in your life, like high drama, it usually comes from high trauma. There's sometimes a need for a lot of drama and yeah. So yeah, it does. It creates a lot of drama. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I have a wise friend who used to just say this was in regards to drugs rather than alcohol, but you could apply it easily. He just used to say, oh, the old friendships. Yep. They just had the drugs in common. That's what they had in common. Yeah. yeah God. I remember going to nightclubs and, you know, dropping a few pills and hanging out with these people. You're like, I love these people so much. I'll never forget them. Like, Wait, this is it. And then like never hear from them again. <laughs> and it's the same with alcohol. I think some of that bonding that happened over alcohol, I just can't believe it. When I look back, I'm like, God, where did those friendships go? And they seem so important at the time. And now they're just kind of gone. Or you see each other and say hi, but it's totally different. So what's it like going to parties now as the sober one? Like, is it a bit of a eye opener or is it more of an eye rolling experience? To be honest, I haven't been to too many parties where it's got really out of control and it's probably because my friend circle has changed a bit, but you know, when I have been at things that have got a bit out of control, I usually leave. I'll stay for a bit. If I know it's going to be that kind of party, I'll say, yeah, yeah, we'll drop in. And we'll go for an hour or two and I kind of get busy in there and, you know, help clean up or cook something or whatever. And then we kind of go. So we don't kind of stay for that long haul. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I guess that's, that's, that's how that, that kind of is. But then the other, like going to parties, just like kind of normal parties or gatherings, it's a bit of a novelty now because I rock up with all these different alcohol-free drinks and everyone's really interested. So we're like, oh, can I try that one? Like I'll bring some um, Monday distillery alcohol-free gins or, you know, their latest offering. And they, um, you know, they've got all these amazing different kind of spirits and whatnot that are alcohol-free and everyone wants to try them. So it's kind of really cool. It's a bit of a, yeah, it is a bit of a novelty and um, it's cool. It gives you something to talk about and um, people are interested. Yeah. What was the first stage of quitting like? Because it sounds like you've got a, you know, clearly got a handle on it now. But like, what were those first few weeks like? Oh, the first few weeks were hell. 
honestly, I was just like, like I said, like, what the hell are we doing? We've been living in Bali, but we'd done a house swap with some people in, in Torquay. So we had a lot of family and friends visiting us because we hadn't been back for a few years. And that was tough. That was really tough. Like trying to just, it was a bit of white knuckling it through and just gulping down soda water um, and just trying my best to get through and just explain, no, it's just a year off, you know, I would, you know, come back and all the rest of it. That was pretty hard. And that's where I had to change my mindset. I knew that, okay, I'm doing this for a year. I'm serious about it. I don't want this to be shit for a year. I don't want to feel shit for a year. That's not why I'm doing this. So I need to change my mindset. So I started looking into ways in which to change your mindset. So, you know, listening to lots of great podcasts, I just drowned myself in Wayne Dyer. I don't know if you know him, (laughs) beautiful spiritual teacher. Yeah. I love Wayne and I'd listen to Wayne every day and I'd had, I had a gratitude practice. I started a gratitude journal and I was writing down quotes of great things I heard and really immersed myself in that world. And I started to, when I woke up in the morning, rather than telling myself I was a loser and a dickhead, I started congratulating myself and saying, today's going to be a great day and well done, Danny. And you did it and give myself a bit of a high five. And then it kind of started to shift and it became easy. It wasn't easy all the time, but it was, I kind of, Ash said, like we made it our hobby and that's true. Like we made quitting our hobby and just read lots and just really, really got into it. And got into that wellness we binged on wellness and that that gave that kind of filled that void as well and it was such a such a better way to be and that's why a year of that a year of living and breathing that kind of stuff you feel pretty differently at the end of it and that's why I thought there is no way it's like chalk and cheese it's like I'm never going back to that never yeah and I'm so glad Do you think you would have been able to do it as successfully if your partner wasn't on board? Like you're so lucky you had this buddy system happening. Mm, mm. Ash and I talk, we're talking about that just the other night because, um, yeah, just like how would we have gone if the other hadn't have done it? And, yeah, I don't know. In all honesty, I don't know if I would have been able to stick it out if he was still drinking and likewise he was the same. I'd like to say, yeah, yeah, we would have been fine, but I don't know. I really don't know. It would be hard and I feel for people that are doing it and their partner without the support of their partner I'm sure that'd be really hard but people do it I've coached lots of people who do it and often their partner comes along for the ride eventually anyway (laughs) but yeah I so I don't know I I, know that's the honest answer yeah I just feel like you were so lucky that all the pieces fell into place the way that they did oh I'm so lucky and from our relationship standpoint like it wasn't in good shape our relationship wasn't in good shape before that. And I think the drinking, the drunken fights, it was all was having its toll, it was taking its toll on our relationship. And that was another reason I thought I'm going to have a year off. And at the end of the year, I'll assess where I'm at with this relationship and then decide. And like, we love each other to bits and that we didn't like, we only have a fought if we're drunk. And it was just, and I thought, oh, I don't want to lose my relationship because of alcohol. And so I was so glad, yeah, when Ash jumped on board as well, and it, but it changed everything. And I think going on a spiritual growth journey together was pretty amazing. Like it's pretty awesome. Mm. I'm pretty lucky. I'm always, I feel very grateful that I've got a husband that's so open-minded. Yeah, and that yeah. you just both happen to be on the same yeah. the same trajectory at the same time. is just, Well, you know, clearly you're meant to be together then, but um, mm. it just makes it so, so much more supported absolutely yeah totally yeah Yeah. so what about the kids like how old were they at this stage and were they aware of what was going on and and how do you have conversations with them about all of this yeah well so it's four and a half years ago and so our eldest Sunny, she would have been about eight eight or nine and our youngest aria was four and Sunny was starting to see the alcohol stuff. Like she would say, oh, dad was really drunk last night or dad was acting silly last night or mom, you were, you know, they were noticing stuff. Mm -hmm. They were noticing our friends that were coming around drinking a lot. And that's like, she'd say, I don't like that person. They drink too much. It scares me. And I was like, wow, like really noticing how much she was noticing. And that was really one of the catalysts, especially like the last big binge where I, um, you know, came out of this sort of blackout and I was vomiting all over myself, over my shoes. And I just thought, I'm 
the poor kids like having to see this all the time. And I just, that was the, that was a big one. So we told Sunny pretty early on, we were taking a year off and that was big too, because to have that accountability to her and she was so happy to hear about it. Oh yeah. And she'd call you out on it. If you screwed up, she'd be like, you're not meant to be doing that. That's what kids do. Yeah. And then (laughs) I could even see the anxiousness in her, like getting towards the end of the year, just like, you know, mum, are you going to start drinking again? And, and I was like, oh, I don't know yet at this stage. And, but we've talked about it since. And that was, you know, she's so happy that we didn't go back. And, um, you know, I remember them panicking once we had some alcohol free champagne or something. They're like, oh, is that good alcohol in it? And I'm like, no, it's okay. So it really did have a bigger effect on them than what we realized, especially Sunny, the eldest one. And so we're just really honest too that alcohol works for some people, but for some people it doesn't. And, um, it, you know, makes people do stupid things, crazy things, if, you know, in some cases. And that was the case for us. And so we're better off without it. And um, yeah. they're happy with that. Do you think some people just can never go back to drinking because they just don't have an off switch? And then on the flip side of that, do you think there's some people that after a year off can go back to like having one at a wedding or a birthday party and leaving it at that and that being a healthy option for them? Yeah, you're probably, everyone listening is going to hate this answer. Ah, here we go. <laughs> but uh, no, not really. I, I've, I've, I've coached people that have been sober for 12 years and thought they'd have just one at a wedding and then they were straight back where they started <clears throat> not to say that it hasn't happened because I you know I'm sure it's happened and I'll probably get a heap of people messaging me and going that's bullshit because I <laughs> it was fine for me but what I've seen and everything that I've yeah everyone I've worked with or people I get messages from it seems that they'll take a certain amount of time off and then start by having one or having two and they start the deals for themselves and before long often they're back to where they where they started or it's a full-time management thing. It's exhausting that they have to kind of really keep it in check all the time. So, yeah, unfortunately, it just seems to be a well-worn yeah. path, you know, with the, yeah. yeah. Dang, so, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> you were going to say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, look, otherwise, I mean, if I could create a program where that was the case, I'd probably be a squidillionaire. Um, but you know, I just know from my own experience, sometimes I wonder, I think, could I ever go back and just have one? Cause I've done so much work on myself, but I wouldn't risk it to be honest. Like I don't see the point and oh my God, what if it went back to how it was? No way. So <laughs> just see, yeah. no, and I'm happy how I am. Yeah. yeah. And also I think the people that you coach is a bit of biased cohort because you're getting the people who are willing to pay to solve this problem once and for all because they they're in a place that is making them really unhappy so yeah. Yeah. they probably shouldn't go back like they're the ones who are who are going to have trouble if they try and go back I guess yeah I have people sign up for coaching too and say that look I, I want to learn to moderate and I'm like well I'm not your person <laughs> yeah. because that's not what I it's not been my experience and I don't want to tell someone that yeah that will work when I, I, I don't have any evidence for that with, with myself. Um, so uh, yeah, unfortunately it's, yeah. But then, like I said, like, I think, well, what, I, it doesn't give me enough pleasure really. It gives me much more suffering than it does pleasure. So I don't, I wouldn't want to go back to just one. It, it just, I'd rather just have soda water. So yeah, bad yeah. answer. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, people do moderation classes and things like that. And there's moderation courses, but um, Jeez, I don't know. Is it there? <laughs> I think so. Okay. They, yeah, Lyndall, my friend who's who's been on my podcast a lot and she works with me um, with the training um, programs, she did moderation courses for a couple of years, like when she lived in New York, but she it didn't help her. Yeah, I was going to say, and does she moderate now? No, she does not. No, she ended up going to AA and, get, you know, going full detox and getting off it and abstinence based now so yeah yeah Yeah. AA is a funny thing isn't it because like the story you told me about yourself is so true for so many people that they have a problem but because they're not waking up and reaching for vodka before midday they feel like they don't belong or qualify you know in you know for the AA community like they're like oh but people in there have got it you know they're having a very different experience of alcohol um Mm. compared to me so yeah like do you 
do you find that like have you had people come to you from AA or is it that you have people come to you for your coaching because they felt like they didn't fit the mold for AA I think both like I've coached people that are even doing AA and do it like together and I've had people that have done AA and then come over because they didn't quite fit the mold and um and then I've had people that just feel like they don't want to do AA (laughs) so that you know and they'll try this um yeah and sometimes that can be if they're in a small country town or if they're a doctor or celebrities you know they don't want to oh yeah no yeah (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yep no (laughs) yeah Yeah. okay so look when when you're helping other people now like what are the first steps you do with them because obviously like you you went really quickly into changing your mindset and looking Mm. at wellness and and those sort that sort of approach is that what you do with your people now yeah it really depends on the person Uh, I find men are very different to coaching than women Um, but pretty much I'll use the compassionate inquiry model that um like Gabo Mate. So I've been studying, that's how I know Emma, who you mentioned at the start. Yeah. Um, yep. That you've been doing that course for the for the last year. And so using that model of trying to get to the, the core beliefs, perhaps the reason why they're drinking, um, what trying to figure out initially, pretty straight up, like what what purpose does alcohol serve in someone's life? What's right about it and and why they use it. So we can kind of understand, okay, how do we how do we tailor something for you that will help you deal with that situation when it comes up, that discomfort that shows up, how are we going to learn to sit with that? And then I, and then I guess kind of um, getting to the core beliefs as to, you know, how someone feels about themselves and have always felt about themselves that's created patterns and coping mechanisms around that. So that's a big part. That's a sort of really trauma informed um, approach. And then, you know, some people it's just setting up a, a plan like a good solid plan of, you know, exercise and and eating well and um, how that, you know, how they're going to deal with certain situations and, you know, just all sorts of little tips. It just really just depend on the person, how far, how, like if they're just starting or if they've been 10 months over or, you know, Um, but really for me, the crux of it is trying to find what is that discomfort for someone that's making them want to drink. And that could be, that they need to completely numb out because they've got so much trauma in their life. They can't deal with it. It could just be stress from work. It could be social anxiety. So realizing that that's the reason to drink. Cause some people think, Oh, I just drink to have fun. And when you start to dig a little deeper, you realize that that's oftentimes not the case. A lot of people are introverted, especially binge drinkers. And so I guess realizing that and then realizing how we navigate life, you know, without alcohol, without that coping mechanism, and um and trying to figure out a way of yeah doing life without that and sitting in the uncomfortable and letting letting our feelings uh, I guess tapping in and listening to what's showing up in our body to see what it is that we're really needing and um it's you know I think that's the big part of this kind of process for me um recovery with alcohol is really about healing healing like past you know past traumas and you know what it is like that reconnection back to ourselves that we've become so disconnected from ourselves, how we feel, how we really feel, Um, you know, covering that up with alcohol for decades is sometimes pretty, you know, it's pretty deep stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people feel socially awkward when they go out as Mm. well. And there's a lot of drinking to cover that up or to, to move through that quickly so that they've got that, like you said before, like that bravado and confidence that you think you're getting or that you feel in that moment. But yeah, I, I, I do, I, a lot of the people that I've known, you know, both friends and clients who do go out and, you know, binge drink, like they're, they're quite socially awkward people. Yes, because you're trying to cover that up, that discomfort up. So I realised it's so funny because, because I've drunk for so long, I just assumed I was this loud Danny, the party girl person, but actually Danny is not the party girl person at all. Danny likes to stay at home and likes (laughs) one-on-one contact with people and likes quiet and time to myself. But because I didn't know that 
And so I was trying to cover up this kind of, I can't stand large groups of people. I cannot stand it. I cannot stand being around a lot of people I don't know because of all the small talk. It Mm. exhausts me. But I never realized that. So, you know, and that was just propelling me to drink more and more. And I think that's why I'd get so like wasted because it just quick, 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 drink, 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 drink. So I don't have to feel uncomfortable anymore. And, yeah. um, and I realized now, so I'll be at a party and I'll say to myself, I'll notice some discomfort start showing in my body. And I'll be like, oh, okay. I'm feeling really uncomfortable right now. That's what I tell myself, not the person I'm talking to, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> but I'll notice what's going into my body and I'm feeling uncomfortable right now. And I try and just sort of feel into it a bit and just tell myself you're feeling uncomfortable and that's okay. You know, and that's just, just saying that to yourself makes me just sort of relax and I kind of get through the conversation and, you know, oftentimes that's enough to make me relax into it a bit more. But I realise now, yeah, I was totally covering that up. So yeah. just having the awareness changes so much. Yeah. And yeah. imagine like I, I imagine that a lot of the people from back then who knew your drinking alter ego mm. would not would have never picked up that you were feeling socially uncomfortable like if you went back and told those people, I'm sure they'd be like, no, she's not. She's like yeah. so confident and bubbly. And it's it, sometimes it's the life of the party person that you have to watch the most. Oh, totally. Now I look at the life of the party person when it's not me <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, I wonder if they're just drinking to compensate for that feeling. <laughs> oh, God, maybe. But it's funny. I remember when I said to Ash once, I'm like, I actually think I'm really shy. And he's like, what? This is my own husband. And then he said, I think I'm the same. And I'm like, what? (laughs) (laughs) And I'm sure my friends um, would just be like, what? But it's true. (laughs) You know, it's so true. We just try and compensate um, so much. Like we spend our whole lives compensating for these feelings rather than just being authentic. (laughs) Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then there's other reasons we that we drink as well. So, for example, like alcohol is linked to that reward center in our brains. So, like mm. we give ourselves a drink as a reward, like we deserve mm. it after a tough day or a tough week. Uh, how do you unlink that association that the reward has to be alcohol or that alcohol equals reward? Yeah, well, that's great because <laughs> the very, very first coaching client I had, um, she was telling me, I just love it. And it's my reward. It's what I do on the Friday night at the end of the day. And it makes me feel good. I just love it. It's my friend. And so I sat there, I was thinking about it and I said, well, how does it make you feel the next day? And you know, what makes me, I hate myself. I feel guilty and regret and shameful. I've got anxiety. I've got a headache and blah, 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 blah. And it went on and on and on. And I was like, well, how much of a reward is that? Not your friend. It's a shit yeah. friend. <laughs> yeah. It's like, if I told you that I had a friend that made me feel full of anxiety, shame, hate myself, regret, gave me a headache, da, 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 da. what would you tell me to do with that friend? And she said, well, I'll tell you to run for the hills. I'm like, well, I'm telling you to run for the hills with alcohol. Like it's not your friend. It's not your reward. And so seeing alcohol for what it is, and I'd make, I would say to people, write that list out of what it promises because it promises you for sure a five-minute, 10-minute dopamine hit. But what it actually promises can be like sometimes up to three days of suffering you know, or oftentimes hours of suffering. Um, and that's what alcohol promises. So to start seeing it for what it really is. And of course, this is if you've got a problem, if you're just having a few wines and you're waking up, you know, fine and off to the soccer the next day, not a problem. Uh, lucky you. But if you're that person that can't stop and it's giving you these adverse effects the next day, then that's what you start seeing. So I'd say to someone, we'll see alcohol as a glass of anxiety or it's a glass of shame or a bottle of regret rather than this is my reward at the end of the day. And it, I mean, God, sometimes even that is enough to turn someone, you know, some mm-hmm. people are harder, harder cases, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that can be huge. That's what I did too early on. I was, I really realized that all this kind of self-loathing and this inner critic and this, how much I couldn't stand myself was directly linked to alcohol because it only ever happened when I drunk alcohol. If I went to bed, and, you know, without drinking and I tucked my kids into bed and I felt great, you know, and did a bit of yoga or whatever and get, went to bed, I woke up feeling okay. Then I never woke up going, oh, fuck, you know, with their racing heart, never. So I, I, I realised that really early on. I thought, mm, you know, saw it for what it is. Yeah. Mm. 
What about the people who are drinking alcohol to relax and they feel like they can't relax without it because it's like that, you know, that whole NLP, it's an anchor kind of mm. thing. Like, mm-hmm. and, and like, do you try and substitute in something else or, or what do you do with them? Yeah. So it's the same thing. It's like asking you. So when you're having a craving for alcohol, I would say, ask your body what it is that you need. And if it's like, um, what am I actually craving? So if it's to relax, I would say to someone, so I teach some really basic breath work, which is just extending your exhale. You know, if you're in that fight or flight response and you need to relax, extend your exhale, a few rounds of breath where, you know, say in for four and out for eight or some box breathing, you know, in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four. It could be a warm bath. It could be a nice long walk or just to stand out in nature and finding other ways to relax. Because let's face it too, it's so much healthier for you to resource in like from yourself, using your own self to, to anchor. Sorry, it's my dog. Um, you know, I know that ear flap noise anywhere. <laughs> it's a beagle too, they're big ears. <laughs> um, you know, so using your own um, internal resourcing to, oh God, sorry, your own internal <laughs> resourcing to find that relaxation within yourself. I think the problem is we know that alcohol is a quick way there but again it's playing it forward okay if I'm having one to relax how relaxed am I at 2 a.m tomorrow morning when I wake up and I'm freaking out about who I've called or who I've texted that's not relaxing so yeah using the breath using nature using bath putting on some nice music there's so many ways in which you can relax you know it doesn't involve alcohol yeah yeah absolutely definitely the bath works for me definitely me too. If I'm feeling super stressed, I'll run a bath pretty much straight away and put some magnesium in it and a few nice oils and that's heaven. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. so good. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. Talk to me about the roller coaster of neurotransmitters that happens when a person stops drinking. How do you keep, you know, how do you keep someone from sliding into depression? Like, yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that can be really hard and that um, that dopamine deficit that people go into. So when they're so used to having so much dopamine and the body ends up, you know, in eventually stops even um, receiving it so much. So we can go, when we stop completely, we can go into that dopamine deficit. And so and that's a really real thing for some people. Some people have that pink cloud of like, I feel amazing. Oh, my God, life's so good. And other people will be weeks in and just going, why do I feel so shit? Like, Why? So I think, you know, good sleep hygiene helps and definitely getting out and moving the body. You know, I've, you know, just half an hour of exercise, 15 to half an hour, 15 minutes to half an hour a day of, you know, good aerobic exercise. So getting the heart rate up can help with um, serotonin. And, and I would say it will come back eventually. Some people can take a long time. It can take months depending on how bad your addiction was. Um, I mean, you'd probably know more about that and other things that people can use for that. But they're the kind of things I use. I also am a big advocate for um, hot cold therapy, ice baths. Oh, um, yes. That'll yeah. give you a bit of a endorphin hit and, and make you feel tough and confident too. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, my challenge today for my group was to have a cold shower. <laughs> so let's you know, get into a cold shower for two minutes and breathe your way through that and see how you feel when you come out so you know little trick little tricks like that um really really do help and then of course you know tuning out from any negative input so i haven't watched the news for four and a half years like literally. You, you missed some things danny i'll well, tell yeah. you right now couple of things that have happened that you need to know about. <laughs> well, funny, you should mention that because I found out that there was a like a global pandemic. Yeah. What? You still knew. <laughs> yeah, I found out there was a flood in our area. You know, I find I seem to find out everything I need to know, but I don't <laughs> need to know those little mundanes of, you know, the day-to-day stuff that goes on oh, and, and that the negativity. Rehashing, like the constant having it put back in front of you. Yeah, it was huge for us. And so I I really worked hard at, um, I was a negative thinker anyway. So, and I had a lot of anxiety. So that was, that was my mission as well to flip that around. And so, yeah, there was no news. It hasn't been since, you know, so there's little things that you can do like that, but definitely exercise is huge. I would say to anyone that's quitting half an hour of exercise every day is the, one of the most important things you can do. Yeah. 
And I often refer people back to this really cool study about not only does exercise help your production of serotonin, but if you do the exercise in the sun, apparently you Mm. produce serotonin more effectively. So there Mm. are studies to show that if you do, and it doesn't even have to be like full cardiovascular, it can just be like a brisk walk or a surf or a little bike ride or something. But if you do that in the sun, like you produce more serotonin and quickly. And I'm like, that is awesome. It's just stick them out in the sun and go for a walk. Like this is like, and I noticed because like I, it had been raining up here in Queensland for like weeks and weeks on end. And then I went for a surf and then on my way home from surfing, I noticed that everything I saw was brightly colored. Like the trees were greener mm. and I was like, what's going on? And I was like, oh, serotonin. Hello friend. <laughs> so yeah, I always refer people back. I think I've even said it on, on this podcast recently. Like it's one of my favourite studies that like I love to show people because I'm like, look, just go and do it in the sun. How amazing is that? Your body knows what to do. That's really, really awesome. And, you know, once you get the serotonin going again, you can actually start healing your brain. So, you know, it's it's pretty amazing. You can start he- healing the damage that's been caused so it's yeah it's amazing yeah so yeah and and again it's not like getting out and getting you like getting your grapevine on it's like a nice good brisk walk you know where you've got your elbows into it a bit and you know like you say a little bike ride or you know swim anything just get get moving yeah absolutely that's gonna like help detoxify you as well every you know it's gonna get your lymph moving it does everything oh it's so amazing yeah yeah yeah. yeah. And yeah, I, I know that, you know, it's like I'm thinking, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, and then that's when we start gut healing with the person and we give them, you know, like some powders and things to help heal the gut. And then that will help the gut brain connection and stop the leaky brain. And that there's so, there's so much we can do at that point. Like once a person is committed to not drinking, like the healing can really begin in earnest rather than just patching a person up time and time again, we can now go in and start to really get into the foundations and, and, and sort it out. And I find that really exciting. Like I love a bit of gut healing and detective work to figure out what needs to be done and looking at, okay, what, what's this done? Like what, you know, has it caused inflammation? Has it caused neurotransmitter deficits? Like, you know, what is it, what has it done and how do we fix it? I love that stuff. Oh, absolutely. And even like getting to the core of an issue, like alcohol, just like Western medicine, it's just a Band-Aid and it's not actually getting to the core, you know, the root of the problem. And so really, you know, we're taking off this Band-Aid, but we're digging a little deeper and really getting to the, the cause of why, like why the pain, why is it there? And can I get to the bottom of that and then start healing in all aspects of our life? Um, it's, it's so huge. It makes, it's, it's massive. You know, we start to heal all areas, like you say, your gut, your liver and your skin and emotionally and spiritually. It's, it's, um, it has such a big effect if yeah. you go into it, you know, all, gu- all guns blazing. I think it's just such a beautiful process and life is so much better. Oh my God, without it. And you think, I remember thinking I could never have, I'll never have fun again. I'll never be fun. Yeah. It's just <laughs> bullshit. It's just such bullshit. Like it's such a lie. Like I have so much fun and I am fun. I reckon I'm more fun now because before I was a pain in the ass, talk over everybody and, (laughs) you know, just overshare. (laughs) (laughs) And at least you remember how fun you were now. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's yeah. like, I can recall that. This is good. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is, totally. Isn't it funny, though, that one of our greatest fears is that we might become boring? Yeah, oh, totally. You know, that's boring such... to ourselves and boring to others. And that's just worrying about other people, right? Or Emma and I, um, in our group session the other day, we were talking about limiting self-beliefs and a lot, of, a lot of the big belief that came up for people around drinking was that they'd never have fun again. And Emma made the great point of, you know, like, we were never taught to have like we had fun before alcohol but we're never it's like we weren't taught really to have fun post alcohol we don't know how to have fun um but you know we did when we were kids we had heaps of fun you know it was living in the moment and just sort of having fun with whatever was there and so relearning again what fun is what what even is fun 
you know, and um, thinking about that because is it really that fun to just sit around listening to the same old music, having the same old conversation? You know, it's different. Fun looks different these days. Yeah. It's a bit like when people worry about giving up coffee and they're worried they'll never have energy again because they're getting their energy or their energized feeling from coffee. And it's like, well, did you have coffee when you were four years old? Did you have energy when you were four years old? Okay. So we've got, we've actually got a precedent here to show that you can do this. Absolutely. And that's one thing that people say, well, I don't know, because I'll often suggest, well, you know, about getting a hobby or a creative pursuit and they'll be like, well, I don't know. Like I don't have any hobby. Like my hobby was drinking. And then sometimes it'll be like going back to childhood. And what did you like in childhood? What did you love? Like what was fun for you then? And then sometimes that will spark something and someone, well, I liked drawing. I think, okay, well, how about trying out some drawing? Or, you know, I liked, you know, cars. Well, you know, you know, so it's sort of tapping back into what we did pre-alcohol. Um, and it's funny, isn't it? Like we survived back then. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we we made fun. We made things fun, and yeah, yeah. It, and you're right. Like the, I think life had more variety back then. Totally, absolutely. And you're just sort of, um, you're just in the moment, right? And you're just kind of going from one thing to the other. It's such a like childhood's a beautiful place to be for a lot of us. Um, in that kind of being in the moment perspective. And um, I remember my sister saying to me once, she goes, I'm going to commit myself to doing something childish three times a day. I'm like, well, how does that look? And she's like, I don't know, like jump on a trampoline or jump in a puddle or, you know, put my hands in the mud. Awesome. <laughs> Skip. Go build a sandcastle. I don't yeah. know, something. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, whatever floats cool. your boat. But I started trying it a bit occasionally as well. And it is fun. It's cool. You know, it's different. Yeah. Yeah, throw the rules out of what, mm. you know, a 30-something, 40-something, 50-something person is meant to look like and act yeah. like. Yeah. And if you didn't listen to those bullshit rules, like what what could you do? I know, I know. I've got really into dancing, into that five rhythms dance. Have you done that? Oh, um, yeah, you're so Byron. That is so Byron. I love it. <laughs> you know, it's so Byron. I could kill myself, but I've just been getting into that and like dancing and really enjoying just sort of dancing, just, you know, just feeling it and dancing it. And look, yeah, it's so, I'm loving that, you know, and not just five rhythms, like just putting on anything, you know, like hits of the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> around the house. And, yes. I don't know. It's that... just good, you know. <laughs> I was loving, you know, that concept of, um, but I think it kind of COVID destroyed it in the regions where I was living, but um, that concept of them doing like lights off dance sessions at, at venues. So you'd turn up to a venue and then they dim the lights so low that you couldn't see each other properly, but just high enough so that you would have an awareness so you don't bump into each other, mm-hmm. but not so much like not bright enough that you could see people's faces or whether they were mm-hmm. sweating or anything. And then people would just like cut loose and dance the way they really wanted to dance because no one was watching, but they were doing it in a group with other people, which is like really good for extroverts. So yeah, I love I love that concept, but I think COVID kind of destroyed that a little bit in some places. Like yeah. someone needs to bring it back. Well, it's back now here. Like, um, is it? Yeah, the, the the five rhythm stuff. But again, that's the same thing. They turn the lights down, and like I remember when I first went, I had to keep my eyes shut because for one. I was sort of judging other people because they look like pretty out there. <laughs> Some yeah. of the people are like, are they on drugs? <laughs> and, but also for myself, I just had to shut my eyes. Otherwise I, you know, so I could just lose myself in it. And um, geez, it was good. Oh, so good. Yeah. 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 So fun. See yeah. what we can do when we let ourselves. I never would have done that before when I was drinking. I just would have hung shit on people that did that like yeah. endlessly. And isn't it <laughs> funny? You'd almost think, you know that like it's the sort of thing you would need a drink to do so that you could lose your inhibitions enough to do the thing yeah when actually it's the opposite isn't that weird I know and challenging yourself in that way and that's one thing eventually you get to this point where it's like I just keep challenging myself to because that was not something that was comfortable for me and now I really like it I also joined like a theater group um I was about three years into my sobriety and um like I'd done a lot of music but I'd never done acting and so I joined a group, the theatre group in Brunswick Heads, and I was the youngest person there. I'm 45. And um, you know, some of the women were in the 80s and 70s, and it was the best thing I've ever done and super challenging. 
but I loved it and I loved the performances and just getting to know these older women and it was just beautiful and I never ever ever would have done anything like that before yeah that's awesome Mm. it's like Mm. a whole world's opened up for you now totally yeah yeah okay so look if anyone's been listening to this and they're shall we say sober curious (laughs) yeah but they don't think they have the strength to do it Mm -hmm. what would you say to them well I would say you know reach like reach out you can always send me a message um tune into my podcast how I quit alcohol there's so many stories of all different sorts of people at different stages in their sobriety and people that have done AA and all sorts of different things um and just listening to other people's stories is sometimes enough to make you not feel so ashamed not feel so alone and um I would just say just yeah reach out to other people that have done it before and talk just talk be honest have a chat see if someone wants to help you or guide you on the journey um, and just see how that feels. Just don't feel ashamed. You know, you don't have to be alone. There's such a huge community out there now. Like when we started, there was nothing like there is now, you know, on Instagram, there's just like, there's so many sober communities. There's a great online resource called Kappa that my friend Victoria Vanstone, she also has a podcast called Sober Awkward. And she started this insane free platform where it's just thousands of people all over the world get together and organize meetups and walks and dating and shags all sorts of stuff oh, wow <laughs> <laughs> cool. um you know and so um yeah there's you know everyone wants to share their story and it's um it's pretty awesome yeah so it, you know people have been through it to usually feel pretty proud of themselves so they're always happy usually to to share or to help yeah. So if you're out there listening to this and you were telling yourself a story along the lines of, yeah, that's all fine for her because she had Ash and they were doing it together. Rah, 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 rah. Like it can still be done. Like there are people out there who are looking for a friend mm-hmm. and a buddy like you right now. And there are communities out there that would welcome you in and support you. Like it, they seem like a friendly bunch, Danny. They do. They really are like, yeah, they're they're just so like everyone I've met in this community, they're just beautiful humans and they're on this journey of, of, of healing and self-discovery and there doesn't seem to be a lot of ego in it. They're just beautiful people that um, kind of get it, you know, they get it. So it's it's really awesome. Mm. And yeah, and they're going through or have been through exactly the same thing and they know all the emotions and all the, the stuff that comes up. Yeah, and goes with that. Yeah, we're sort of like evangelists, like those annoying Christians that play the tambourines. <laughs> <laughs> like we're trying to recruit more people, so we've got more awesome people to hang out with. <laughs> yes, join our community. I'm just going to talk in tongues, but you know, <laughs> that's for drunk people. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think I think it's awesome, and yeah, you're right. Like a few years ago. This, this wasn't on the radar in this sort of way. And, and the way that I can see that it's changed is because of all those, you know, those drink brands that you mentioned earlier that mm. are now making these really lovely, like, alcohol-free drinks that you can take to parties and things. They didn't exist 10 years ago. Oh, they're amazing. And it's like taking the world by storm. And, like, mm. things like the Monday Distillery drinks and there's other ones, um, you know, that, that taste like a gin and tonic, exactly, but they've got no sugar. They've got all these botanicals in them. They've, you know, they're just beautiful drinks and they look really grown up and adult and they're gorgeous. They taste amazing. And so you kind of don't feel at all like you're kind of different or missing out when you rock up to a party with those, you know, amazing. Heaps Normal, I think, is the top third top selling beer in Australia at the moment. It's got wow. no alcohol in it. <laughs> it's crazy amazing. talk. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's so awesome. And, and I, I've just, heard in yeah. Melbourne there's whole bottle shops that are not alcoholic. And bars, there's that um, Brunswick Aces, in Brunswick, alcohol-free bar. And I think Dan Murphy's has opened one out in the suburbs somewhere because they're copying Brunswick Aces, but yeah. good on them. Yeah, Dan um, Murphy's like, shit, we're losing market share. What should we do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Quick. We'll copy the little guys. Um, yeah, and, you know, but good on them. You know, it's great that there's another thing like that out there. And, you know, look at the... Um, alcohol free section in Coles and Woolies now like it's getting bigger and bigger and, and bigger because because I know you yeah. don't walk into Dan Murphy but no. I do sometimes and I'll tell you right now there's like a whole rack 
of alcohol free, like you said, like gins that aren't gin and, you know, Prosecco and all these different things that are all alcohol free. They They were um, not there even two years ago. They certainly went when we started. There's another great lady on Instagram, her handle, I think it's called Dry But Wet. Her name's Amy Armstrong. And she reviews, she's got a whole business out of um, helping businesses set up alcohol-free options, restaurants and things. But she reviews heaps of different alcohol-free wines and beers and will say what's rubbish and what's not. And she's awesome. Like, so if anyone was kind of curious as to what's good and what's not, you know, I'd say follow her and or send her a DM. She's awesome. It's very that's, helpful. That's the next thing we want to see, huh? Is like a an alcohol free alternative on nice restaurant menus that isn't yeah. kombucha or sparkling water because people can get maybe not your husband, but people can get sick of that. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And there's yeah, so many options. Like, now. like yeah. we, I've caught up with a group of the people that like are in my challenge group in Melbourne. We went to this bar and they had like mocktails. Uh, so it was a restaurant, Thai restaurant, and they had, you know, different mocktails available, which were beautiful. And a lot of restaurants now are doing like non-alcoholic pairing um, with wow. a degustation meal um, menu. It's amazing. Like some of them are awesome um, all over the place. So it's really mm. cool. Like it's really, there's so many options out there for people now. It's really great. Even if That's you do really drink, cool. you might just want to have a, Maybe you could, you know, have a couple of beers and then have a heaps normal and then, yeah. you know, just pace yourself. Yeah. yeah. Or just you might drink but also like having nights off from drinking. Yep, absolutely. And they're really good options. So, yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. I can't wait to see where this whole niche goes in the next five years because it's grown so much in the last five. Like it's really exciting. It is so exciting, especially for someone like me, you know, it's great. It just yeah. it makes my job easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you've yeah. done the hard yards, but now your clients don't have to. <laughs> no, yeah. No, like, and I know that the alcohol-free beers don't work for everybody. For some people, it can be a trigger. Mm. Um, but Same with the wines as well. Yeah, I can't drink the wines because even the smell of it makes me feel a bit ill, but I can do the alcohol-free gins and I can do the alcohol-free beers. Like, well, that, was, that wasn't my drink, you know, so. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, there is, there's a, a whole discussion around that that I've seen on social media about, you know, if if it's a trigger for you, like don't drink the alcohol-free version right now because like you, yeah. you kind of need to distance yourself from that look and feel and taste right now. So, you know, different things work for different people. Totally. And once you have enough distance, like, um, like Ash didn't drink alcohol-free beers for a while, but now he's like, I really like beer. I love beer. I love the taste of beer and the ritual of it, but I don't like alcohol. So he can really differentiate that this beer has no alcohol in it or a tiny minute, about as much as an apple or a banana. Um, and then, yeah, I think once you've figured that out in your mind, I think it's not so much of a trigger, but it can be a trigger for some people. I would love to see his writer request now when he's doing like concerts and shows. I'd love to see what what's written on that writer list. It is clear. Actually, I should do that as an Instagram post is before yes. um, 2018 and as to what it is now. But what's so funny, we're talking about it for us. Like, do they always give you alcohol free beers? And he said, like, you know, it's like sandwiches, alcohol free beer, honey to have with his tea. There's teas on there. <laughs> <laughs> oh god things have oh, changed yep yep how used to be like exactly used to be like beer and whiskey and scotch and all the things all the things mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah that's it welcome to middle age guys <laughs> <laughs> you made it <laughs> yeah. yeah all right my love um look tell us about like where people can find you and what you do because you do coaching but you've also got challenges that you do like you've built this beautiful community as well Mm -hmm. so yeah how can people find you and and connect with you and get help probably the best way is on instagram at at how i quit alcohol or the website i quit alcohol.com.au or the podcast which is how i quit alcohol and yeah i've got um sober courses like challenges that run for six weeks or i do one-on-one coaching but if also if mine is not a good fit for you, for someone, I can suggest other great, like there's other amazing coaches that also do amazing um, courses as well um, out there. There's Thriveless Society in um, in Melbourne. She's amazing. Lucy, she's been on my podcast. And, you know, the AA Fellowship Program is amazing. And there's lots of different courses. So, you know, or perhaps like someone might need to get in, in contact with a, a therapist, say, 
um, you know, I can certainly help yeah. try and guide someone in the right direction. So, yeah, yeah, but, you know, sometimes just like listening to the podcast, I get so many messages every day from people saying, oh, my God, I've quit for a year and all I did was listen to your podcast, you know, and that costs nothing, you know, and that's great because there's so many people just giving suggestions and, you know, that might resonate with someone and, you know, what they did, they'll try that and, like, that worked for someone. And yeah. um, it's, it's really cool. Amazing. And I, I love that collaborative mindset that you've got of mentioning other people who are working in this space rather than seeing them as competition. It's like we're all working for the same cause. And I love that because it means the right person will find the right helper because Absolutely. you're all like, you know, being generous and collaborative together. So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, look, this has been honestly like one of the most amazing podcast interviews I've done in ages. Like I, 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 oh. I've, yeah, it's been really inspiring and I really think this will help a lot of people. So Danny, thank you so much for sharing your time today, but also thank you for you know, blazing the trail and doing the hard yards and now using that to help others. Oh, thanks, Jules. That Yeah, thank you. And thank you for saying that. And I hope I'm going to get you on my podcast soon too to talk about, um, you know, what you do and suggestions that you might have for people that are going to be Let's quitting do it. alcohol. Awesome. I love that. Amazing. Thank you. And I'll put all the links for everything you mentioned in the show notes as well. So they'll all be there for everyone to find. Beautiful. Thanks, Jules. Yeah. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed listening to Straight Talking Natural Health. If you liked what you heard, make sure you hit subscribe so that you're the first to know when new episodes drop. In the meantime, head over to my website at julesgalloway.com. There's all kinds of resources available there if you're keen to get started to live your best, healthiest, most energized life. When I'm not podcasting, I'm seeing clients one-on-one via Zoom. So why not book in and let's work together? I love helping my clients to heal from fatigue, anxiety, inflammation, gut problems and chronic health issues, to name just a few. All of this and more is available right now over at julesgalloway.com. That's all from me for the time being. I look forward to diving in with you again in the next episode. Bye for now.